One. Good morning. Today's sermon will be briefer than normal for me, for me, briefer than normal for me, uh, by necessity. One of the side effects of this, my third round through COVID, is that I don't have a voice that can do the full sustained uh, day's worth of continuous talking that I normally, that I'm accustomed to on a Sunday. It's a, it's a bit of a bummer for me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about you. Um, I'm, by the way, through the, uh, through the isolation phase and the, just the end phase here, and so also it's a bummer that I'll be wearing this mask through the sermon, and then after the sermon, I'm just going to dip right out that back door and uh, get out of here. And so the bigger bummer is I'm going to miss all this Sunday fun day stuff, like the mac and cheese with the barbecue they're serving out there. That sounds great. And bounce houses that are uh, that any of you can participate in, right? Uh, it's not child only. And really, what I'm sad about is I'm going to miss greeting you at the door. Uh, that's one of my favorite things to do on a Sunday. Not only for those of you who are here every Sunday, but for those of you who've joined us the fir- for the first time today, I love to say hello at the door and, and get to know you better. <clears throat> and so. Um, Missing that, I'll say what I normally would say uh, right now, which is one, if, if you're here for the first time today, we're really glad that you came. We're <laughs> really glad that you're here and hope you'll come again. And uh, if there's anything we can do for you, let me know. And then for those of you who come around from time to time, uh, I love you and I'm glad you're here. And I hope you have a good rest of your Sunday and a good rest of your week. All right. Now imagine that with a handshake and a hug and all the stuff later on. I'll, we'll just pretend. We've been talking a lot lately about uh, restoration, restoring what's most important in our lives, and uh, we've discussed our desire to restore faith and to restore community, and we've described Sabbath as the environment in which these and other types of restorations occur. And today, I want to talk a little bit more about another type of environment for restoration, and that is um, Christian hospitality or fellowship, the environment in which community and love is restored. We have this scene in the gospel today, or at least a portion of a scene in the gospel today. Glasses are not going to work with the, uh, the fogginess here. So we have this scene, portion of a scene in the gospel today, where Jesus has chosen a Sabbath again as the environment in which he's going to do some restoring work. Is gathered together with teachers of the law, Pharisees, and the leader of the Pharisees in this area, this group of Pharisees, has invited Jesus either to provide hospitality or to target Jesus as a, a person for ridicule and scorn or, or challenge or something like that. It's hard to know what the intent was of the host because Jesus never lets the guy get started. No, like, welcome everybody to the dinner party. Here's why we're gathered here tonight. Jesus immediately goes after him. And not him alone, but all the rest of the Pharisees that are there. Jesus sees a man with uh, edema. And he has this question that the Pharisees should already know the answer to, because they've already talked about this in the last chapter. Is it lawful to cure this man on the Sabbath? In the last chapter, they would have said no, and then he would have explained why yes is the actual answer, and then he would have done the healing. In this chapter, he doesn't have time for all that, so he just heals the guy before they ever answer, and then he tells them why they were wrong with the answer that they didn't have time to give, which is awesome. Uh, (laughs) And so he cures the guy, sends the guy on his way, and you can imagine that at this point, the host who is so glad that he invited Jesus to dinner, is thinking, maybe we can all just come and like sit down and have dinner now. How about that? How about we all just stop and sit down and eat? And so Jesus, uh, looking to like pick a fight, decides to pick a fight about that too. Everybody starts to jockey for position, right? To sort out their social status and their pecking order by elbowing with each other to see who's going to sit closest to the right hand of the host or the left hand or so on and so forth, and who gets the head of this table, and where are people going to sit? What Jesus points to with a little bit of a scolding eye, perhaps, is that 
Everybody's in it for themselves, and that, that's actually even true for the hosts. And so, friend, hey, listen, you're looking after your own needs here too. Your guest list tells me that you're here looking to trade favors. Selfishness and ego are your motivating factor. Nobody is creating an environment for love here. Nobody's offering true hospitality. Perhaps you've seen churches like that. Throughout history, there have been churches like that, failing to offer true hospitality, jockeying for position, looking for ways to bestow honor upon themselves and not necessarily to share it with others. The preacher from the book of the Bible we call Hebrews uh, assumes that the church knows that from time to time this happens. So he writes this, let mutual love continue. Behind the word mutual love, there's the Greek word Philadelphia. And you know Philadelphia, right? The city of brotherly love. Let sibling-like love continue. The kind of love that you have for your brothers and sisters, even in a church where you're not related to each other, let that continue. And practice hospitality. The love of stranger, or in Greek, philozenia. Let Philadelphia and Philozenia continue. Because you're never going to be sure who that guest is. And some people have entertained messengers of God not even knowing it before. The environment that the church is as it gathers should love a stranger until that stranger becomes like a brother or sister. And then let mutual love continue between brothers and sisters. Love within and love for all. Not every church can be described in this way, can it? Sometimes church looks like people jockeying for position. It's not new to this time in our lives. It's always been there. Sometimes it looks like us trying to gather around the table and not necessarily making sure that there's space there for everyone or wondering about the holiness or relative holiness of the person next to us at that table. It can look like that from time to time, but we can also do better because we've been called to a better way. I've watched as communities just like ours and spaces just like ours have been transformed as we provide space at the table for everyone. I've seen how people find their way to the table to become that one that God has called them to be. It's a great definition for hospitality, right? When we create a space that allows another person to enter in and become who God has called them to be. This is a table with enough seats for all of us to become who we were called to be. And as a community, become a community that loves a stranger until a stranger becomes a sibling and then keeps loving so that mutual love will continue among all of us. And that kind of hospitality, well, that requires some real strength, doesn't it? And it's going to be tested time and time again because we're not always easy to love. Each one of us has our moments where we're actually kind of difficult to love. Being a table that has a seat here for all of us means all of us, even when we are difficult to love. So we have to like double down on our commitment here a little bit so that we can create this environment in which love can grow and in which God's message can be shared. You may have heard this parable that I want to leave you with <clears throat> before. It is out there in many different forms. I don't know who the original author was. There are different details in each version of it, but it goes something like this. Long ago in like medieval Europe, there was a monastery and there were monks living in the monastery, but a decreasing number of monks over time and their relationships with one another were intense. Community life can be hard for all of us, even just in the communities of our family. There are people who will get on our nerves from time to time, and even people that we love, well, sometimes, if we spend enough time with them, 
things that they do can become intolerable. Happens with monks too. Brother Simeon always chews with his mouth open. Can't stand the sound of his smacking anymore. Brother Matthew always snores. There's that one brother who always pushes his seat away from the table after breakfast or dinner and makes that skrrr sound every time. I think he does it on purpose. Maybe you have people like this in your life or in your family. Innocuous things, each one of them, but over time, whew, they get on our nerves. There were only like four or five monks left in this monastery, and so they were constantly on each other's nerves. And the culture became one of low tolerance for one another and the annoyances of one another. And so tension would rise and backbiting would begin, and they were talking behind one another's backs, even though there were only like four or five of them left. The abbot was distraught, and he couldn't really talk to his monks about this as much as he wanted to, so he goes to share this with the rabbi. And he shares his grief, <clears throat> and, um, and, the, and the rabbi listens. One moment. Rabbi listens, shoulders some of the burden of that grief. And then before they, uh, they end their meeting, the rabbi says, well, listen, just one thing that you should know. It's widely known in our community that in your community, the Messiah is here. The Messiah is one of you. The abbot's somewhat stunned, goes off, quietly considering what those words mean. Eventually, it makes its way around the rest of the monks that are there that Christ is among us and has returned. Formerly cross and tense moments. <clears throat> Sorry. Formerly cross and tense moments when the monks would have to listen to that one monk snoring again or chewing with his mouth open changed altogether because suddenly the monk had to say, maybe that's Jesus chewing with his mouth open. Maybe that's... Jesus himself snoring. Maybe that's the Christ scooting his chair away from the table and making that darn sound one more time. And so every encounter changed and mutual love and joy was restored. And the monastery went on to thrive in its work and in its prayer. That's Christian hospitality, <clears throat> the assumption the assumption that the one that we are encountering, stranger or friend, is the Christ, or could be. It's a discipline that will be tested time and time again and will often lead to the disappointment when we find out that in fact that was not the Christ, but maybe a part of that person's heart is Christ-like. It's within this environment that we find our purpose as a community. And it's within this environment that the message of God's love is continued to be shared. Shared by sometimes annoying people and sometimes angelic people and often both. People who are both just like you and me. And we who are both just like everyone else, stranger or sibling, have a seat at a table where Jesus himself is the host. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.